all these years of sanctions, the people who have suffered are the ones that are not associated with the government, nor with the brutality, nor with the predation. They're the people who live hand to mouth in Tehran and all the other cities. And we welcome Professor Brenda Schaefer. Uh, right now, she's a visiting researcher at Georgetown University's Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies. Professor Brenda, very good evening to you. I'm told within these last hours that the expectations are very high, but that the economy is broken and that the poverty is especially hard on the families in Tehran, that's what I was told about, and the larger cities. What can you tell us about the economy and the, the ordinary, the bus drivers and the people who depend upon uh, street selling and the street vendors. Good evening to you. Good evening. Well, you know, there's high expectations in Iran that um, the Iran deal and the rollback of sanctions will bring, you know, sort of immediate uh, economic benefit in Iran. And I think there's this huge gap between the reality that's uh, surfacing there now um, and and uh, um, the, the expectations. And this is usually the recipe for social instability when you have high expectations, you know, and and and, and the reality hits it hits people in the face. So definitely, it's a, you know, you're going to have, for instance, um, with the return of some of the uh, frozen assets from abroad um, estimated around $50 billion. Granted, most of that money will stay abroad because that's the whole you know, meaning of assets, right? But, but part of it, when it gets back, this is going to unleash a struggle between different, different sectors in Iran, you know, different militias um, for control of this money, for what's done with the money. And the question is, you know, how much of that will actually trickle down to the population? Probably, uh, you know, very little. Also, with the very, very low uh, oil price right now, um, even when Iran gets back up to the levels, not that it's going to get very soon to pre-sanction level production, but e- even if it gets, let's say, half of its pre- pre-sanction level uh, production, um, the, the oil price is so much lower that even, even you know, with going back to those, those numbers of barrels, um, you're not going to see that, that, that anything near the type of revenue that it had before the sanctions were in place. And we have to remember the pre-sanction price when they went out of business was $109 a barrel, and they were uh, budgeting at that level. Today, I think they just want to get back into it at any price. So yeah. there won't be a windfall. And 45% of the economy controlled by the IRGC and the government, they will be the major beneficiaries. But one of the things that you have taught me a long time ago was to look at Iran in a different way. Uh, because we tend to look at it as a monolith. We, th- we, we call them Iranians or Persians. But in fact, it's a very diverse population with very significant segments that are not Persian. Could you explain somewhat of the, the structure of, of Persian society, of Iran society? Sure. Well, just as you said, Malcolm, we tend in the West to call, you know, talk about Persian music, Persian people, P- Persian food. But talking about Persia is like talking about California versus, you, you know, the United States or England versus the, the, the United Kingdom. Right? It's, just, it's just a part. And actually, Iran is 50 percent non-Persian ethnic minorities, 50 percent half of the population of Iran. And not only is it half of the population is ethnic minorities, but most of those ethnic minorities are, are, are um, concentrated in Iran's border areas, and they have co-ethnics in bordering countries. So let's say the Arab population of Iran is populated near Iraq uh, with, with, you know, with Arab, Arab uh, co-ethnics on the other side of the border. The Turkmen population of Iran is populated near Mashhad. Over the border is Turkmenistan. And the Azerbaijani population of Iran, one-third of the population over the border, the Republic of Azerbaijan. So you see that this ethnic issue not only is it a very complicated domestic issue that, that influences their stability, it also influences their foreign relations with almost every bordering country because of these shared populations. The puzzle I have about Iran right now, and we just have a moment, Brenda, the puzzle I have right now is there's an election coming up. Is this an anxiety for the regime that the people are alienated because of the broken economy? Well, I think, you know, the fact that the, so far the regime has dismissed most of the, you know, except for its hand-picked candidates, it's it's rejected about 3,000 so-called reformist uh, candidates. So, obviously, they're not very confident if they have to, if they have to reject um, all these people. But, yeah, I think there's a lot of hurdles, you know, the the elections and and the February 26th will be, you know, also also a test for um, the stability of the regime. There could be a lot of um, instances connected to it. 
Also, the spiritual leader, uh, Ali Khamenei, he's very ill. He's openly appeared, you know, getting cancer treatments and in, in Iranian newspapers. The fact this was something that was probably well known for a long time that he, he, he was ill, but the fact that it was in the Iranian newspapers in the fall shows that it's sort of a signal of a succession crisis uh, in Iran. So we'll probably see also that playing out, even if he if he stays alive, um, depending on his, on his health situation, different people trying to grasp different parts of the power, power anchors of the, of the system. I think something that's really worked to the advantage of the, uh, to, to Iran is they, they play quite well this good cop, bad cop uh, image, you know, the, the, the moderates versus the radicals. Every time something bad happens there, anti-American, you know, if the sailors are captured, it's because the, 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 uh, the hardliners did it, you know, and, and if uh, uh, Washington Post diplomat is a, is a is uh, incarcerated because the hardliners in what they always have this good cop bad cop mechanism um, to help explain uh, really their policies uh, towards the West and it's very useful for them. Uh, Malcolm, we're, we're going to say uh, right now that Iran is fragile. Is very that a fragile. fair? And will, will the ethnic minorities vote as a bloc? Yes or no? Brenda? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I missed that last. Will they vote as a bloc? I, I, in Iran? Yeah. You know, I, I don't know how much the I mean I don't know how much the elections. Have All right, we'll done. have okay, to leave we'll it there. I'm sorry, time. Professor uh, Brenda Schaefer of Georgetown, Malcolm Honline. I'm John Batchelor.